Today, um, we're going to spend some time in uh, the book of Habakkuk. Um, very familiar, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with it, probably haven't memorized by now. Um, uh, but one of the reasons why we're going to spend some time in Habakkuk is because right now I'm kind of uh, a little bit of a transition. You know, we went through a whole series of uh, the first part of this year in the Sermon on the Mount. And then, you know, we went through about four Sundays of the series on the Cosmic Christ. And now it's just trying to find where we're going to go next. And so we're just going to address some different things here and there until the Spirit prompts me to, to do something like that. And so... Um, as many of you know, we, 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 we spent a lot of time um, kind of changing the way in which we see God. We want to see God differently. We don't want to see Him as this angry, punishing monster. Um, we want to change maybe the way we see Jesus. Jesus isn't just this substitution that, that was murdered by God in my place. Um, you know, but we also maybe want to change the way we think God sees us. Because if we think the way God sees us is different than the way God actually sees us, it's going to affect the way we see God. And so, um, we want to, there, there, so there's a lot of passages in the Bible um, that are often misquoted, are often used out of context, and they're one verse, or in this case, one part of a verse in one chapter, in one book, in one half of the Bible that we put a whole lot of weight on. Okay? Especially when we have lists of other passages that say what that passage misquoted isn't saying. And so the passage that gets misquoted is so many times we hear that God's eyes are so pure that He cannot even look upon us. How many people have heard that? I know Ryan has because he brought it up several months ago in one of the forums. Right? But God's eyes are so pure, He cannot even look upon us. And we think that that's a biblical passage, and it's not. It's a misquoted, out of context, piece of a Bible passage. So if you go to Habakkuk, because once again this is also coming from Habakkuk. Um, and so uh, Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 it says your eyes are too pure to approve evil and you cannot look on wickedness with favor why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they why have you made men like the fish of the sea, like creeping things without a ruler over them? The Chaldeans bring all of them up with a hook, drag them away with their net, and gather them together in their fishing net. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they offer a sacrifice to their net, and burn incense to their fishing net. Because through these things their catch is large, and their food is plentiful." Will they, therefore, empty their net and continually slay nations without sparing? So nowhere in there do we hear anything about how God's eyes are too pure to look at us. Okay? Habakkuk is not happy with God. Okay? This is not a book of praise to God. This is a book of a guy looking up at God, shaking his fist in anger at God. My understanding, so now I'm going to put it in a little bit of my language. Habakkuk is saying, my understanding of you, God, is that your eyes are too pure to look upon evil. So why are you looking upon evil? Why are you allowing bad people to do good things? If you're so pure, you're so holy. But yet, you let bad people become rich. You make bad people our rulers. And, and you don't even give us a ruler. But yet the rest of these people, these Chaldeans, which we're not going to go into the Chaldeans. We come across them again in Revelation. Chaldeans are not, we don't like Chaldeans, okay? Chaldeans are bad, okay? Um, and they go and they're scooping up all these people. They're taking away all your people away from you. Why don't you do something about it, God? You're so pure 
you're so holy, but yet you let this evil go on. Right? So, the point is, nowhere in this passage does it say that you are so sinful that God can't even look at you. So let's stop thinking that. Okay? Let's stop thinking about that. Because, Job 28, 24. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. Job 34, 21 through 23. His eyes are on the ways of mortals. He sees their every step. There is no deep shadow, no utter darkness where evildoers can hide. God has no need to examine people further that they should come before him in judgment. Psalm 30, I'm going to, this is going to be a minute, so just, you don't have to, I mean, if you want to flip, you can, but I'm going to go quickly. Psalm 33, 13 15, through 15. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all of the children of man from where he sits enthroned. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. Psalm 94, 9. Does he who fashioned the ear not hear? Does he who formed the eye not see? Proverbs 5.21 For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. Proverbs 15.3 The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Jeremiah 16.17 My eyes are on all of the ways, they are not hidden from me, nor is their sin, nor is their sin concealed from my eyes. Jeremiah 17.10 I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Daniel 2.22 He knows what is in the darkness. Hebrews 4.13 Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. Revelation 2, 18 and 23. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like a blazing fire. I am He who searches the hearts and the minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. So we have one, one part of a verse, one line out of five lines of a verse, misquoted, out of context, in one chapter... In one book, in one half of the Bible, and we build an entire theological framework that God's eyes are so pure, He cannot look upon us. But we have a whole list of, and these aren't the only ones, a whole list of scriptures that say the exact opposite. That God does see us. God does see us in our darkness. God does see us in our pain. God sees us everywhere. There is nowhere where we can go where God does not see us. So, we talk about we want to change the way we think God sees us. Okay? Hopefully over the last year or so we've been able I've been able to help maybe help you change the way you see God and, and maybe not see God as so angry and so distant and so uh, punishing and so retributive and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and maybe we've changed a little bit of the way we see Jesus. And Jesus isn't just this substitution for me, but Jesus is the model for me. Jesus is what I am supposed to be. Jesus is fully man and fully God. And he's showing me the way to live my life. Not just how to die and go to heaven one day. But if we think that God thinks about us things that aren't there, it's going to be hard for us to change the way we see God. So we have to change the way we think God sees us. How does God see us? What are the, what's the lens in which he sees us? Well, he sees us at all times. He sees us in our nakedness. He sees us in our sinfulness. He sees us in our darkness. And still, before the foundation of the world, He chose us. He's never changed His mind about us. He never will change His mind about us. He never gives up on us. He never will give up on us. Why? Because He's God. He created us. And before the foundation of the world... He chose us to be in Him. It's that simple. And that, tell, that should tell us all we ever need to know about what God thinks about me. That He created all of this for me. 
He created a rose. If you love roses, he created a rose just for you. He created cute little puppies just for Karen. Just for her. If Karen was the only person alive and she loved cute little puppies, he would have created cute little puppies. He created deer for Ryan to shoot. <laughs> whatever it is you love, whatever it is you find beauty in, God created that just for you. Why? Because you are so sinful and so evil and so depraved that he can't even look at you? I'm sorry, but if that's true, I don't even know if I believe in God anymore. Because I don't believe in that God. I don't believe in the God that decided that he was going to come into humanity as one of us and then was going to beat himself was going to nail himself to a cross and was going to basically commit suicide so he could, like us, it, I mean, it all, it all just begins to fall apart if we can change the way in which we see God. And if we begin to understand God as God's love being unconditional, God's love is without conditions. We talk a lot about deserving, and I know some of you still have issues with that deserving, Right? Bonnie, what did Jesse ever do to deserve your love? The moment Jesse was born, Bonnie loved him. He hadn't spoken a word. He hadn't taken a step. He hadn't cleaned his room. He hadn't peed his pants. He hadn't done anything right. He hadn't done anything wrong. And she loved him. And there was nothing that he could have ever have done to stop her from loving him. But you're going to tell me that Bonnie and all of her sin and all of her flaws is a better parent than God? How does that make sense? So I'm going to have, I have to love my children unconditionally? No matter what my kids do, I have to love them no matter what, but God doesn't? So I'm held to a higher standard of love than God is? What? I'm a better father than God? I, I, I'm a better lover than God? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so we have to undo some of these things, these, these fallacies, that God is so pure that He cannot even look upon us as sinful, as sinners, that, once again, isn't true. And it's not found in Scripture. We say it is, because how many people know to look at Habakkuk to find out if that passage is true or not? How many people are willing to find Habakkuk? Because literally, it took me 10 minutes standing up here one day, on Monday. It took me 10 minutes to find Habakkuk. It's so small that after five minutes, I had to look up what page it was on, and I still couldn't find it. Because I'm like, well, if I guess I get a little close to the page, I'm sure I'll be in it. No! Oh, I lost it again. Oh, there it is. Okay, it's back. It's back. Right? I couldn't even find Habakkuk. So how many people are willing, when they hear that, they say, well... It sounds good. I mean, that guy seems like he knows what he's talking about, so we'll just, you know, believe him, right? It's called, you know, we were talking about this Friday, lying with confidence. It's, I used to do it. I don't do it anymore. I don't do it anymore. But a lot of people, they, they, just, they just make stuff up. But, they, but it sounds like they know what they're talking about, so we're just going to believe them. And God's eyes are so pure that he cannot even look upon your sinfulness. Sounds plausible. But we find out that it's one verse... Well, sorry, one line in a verse, misquoted, in one verse, in one chapter, in one book, in one half of the Bible. And yet we put so much emphasis on that. Instead of us really digging in, once we go back to the tricycle, who's the God of my experience? When I needed God to show up in my life, who showed up? Did he show up with a belt, or did he show up with a hug? When I really was desperately searching for something, who showed up? The one who told me I was enough, or the one who told me I wasn't good enough? So, who is God? 
And as let's allow the God of our experience, the God that shows up in our life, be the God that shows up in our scriptures. Because that's the God that shows up in scriptures. Time and time and time again. Whether it's Moses in the calf, in the golden calf. Or when Moses says, God, show yourself. Or when God shows up and judges and, and brings uh, the, the, the Jews out of whatever situation they were in. Or when God shows up in Exodus and brings the Jews out of slavery. Or when God shows up in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to bring us out of our religious darkness. To bring us out of our our conditioning whatever box he kind of maybe he maybe he came to bring God out of our box because we put the box in and we said this is who God is and God fits so nice and neat, neatly and tightly inside of our box of the law and Jesus says God cannot fit inside of your box he's far too big for that and so once again when God literally showed up in our scriptures what did he look like what did he talk like how did he sound? And when I talk about this, people always say, well, yeah, but, but, but Jesus got angry. He got angry at the, in, the, in the temple, and he started kicking over tables and, and pushing people away and yelling at them. And, yeah, but did he? But did he? Or was he just mocking them? Because Jesus, once again, never said that how t- the temple was holy. Jesus said that there's the time coming and now is the time when you no longer worship in the temple. God said in 2 Samuel, we talked about it last week, 2 Samuel 7, God never told David to build him a temple. And Jesus is in the temple and he goes, this is your sacred space? This is, this is your holy place? And look what you guys are doing to it! This is what you should be doing because you find this space so Holy! And, and, I, and I kind of believe, and once again, I'm out on a limb here. There's no support for this. But knowing what I know about Jesus, I'm thinking that he probably is mocking them. Because this is your holiest place, and this is how you treat it? You guys are idiots. No, I'm not saying that, Jesus. But I'm, I mean, he probably, he might have thought it, okay? He might have thought it. I don't know. This is why i got to put notes on computers that says don't call them idiots. Because I'm not Jesus. I say it. He might, But he might have think it. I don't know. And so, um, you know, so we, we, we did this uh, exercise a while back, right? And I put God up here, and we made the tree, and you guys came up with all sorts of stuff about who God is, right? Okay, God is love, and God is this, and God is that, all this kind of stuff, but we missed the point where we got to Jesus. We never mentioned that. So we had to come back next week and we had to explain that God is Jesus. And Jesus is the exact representation of God's nature. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I don't speak of my own, but I speak of what the Father tells me to speak. Uh, we hear where Jesus is the, 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 the perfect image or the, the, the image of the invisible. Um, all these passages that we spent a good month going through. That says when we see God, we need to see Jesus. And how Jesus sees me is how God sees me. And how does Jesus see me? Does Jesus see me as somebody who is so sinful that he couldn't even look at me? Is that, is that how Jesus treated Zacchaeus when he was climbing up into the tree just to look at him? Is that how Jesus treated the, the, the prostitute or the drunk or the tax collector? How did Jesus see us? Now, once again, how did Jesus see the Pharisees? Then how did he see the sinners? Because once again, he didn't come to correct the sinners. He came to correct the religious. He didn't didn't tell the prostitute, you don't have the word of God abiding in your heart. He told that to the religious leaders. A whole group of pastors that had collected there to, to trap them. He told them, you don't have the word of God abiding in your heart. You've never heard from the Father. You've never seen the Father because you can't see me. You spend all your time locked away in your offices, studying your scriptures, trying to find eternal life. But you will never have eternal life because you won't see me. And I am eternal life. Once again, he didn't say that. 
to the drunks and prostitutes and the tax collectors. He told that to the people who think or thought they knew who God was. They understood God because they went to seminary. They understood God because they studied the scriptures. And they knew what the law said. Jesus came to blow up their whole system. You are so holy. You are so pure. You are so righteous. You're so lawful. And look what you do to your most sacred of places. Your temple. That you built to worship your God in. And look what you've done to it. So, how does Jesus see me? Real quickly. First of all, he sees me in him. And he sees me through the cross. If you ever want to know what God thinks of you, all you have to do is look at the cross. Because that is how much he's willing to go through. That is what he's willing to do to show you how much he loves you. I will let you. Time and time and time again. Jesus turned himself over to, to, to Gentiles. Jesus turned himself over to sinners. Jesus was to be killed by Gentiles. Jesus was to be killed by sinners. We human beings, I'm pretty sure all of us are Gentiles. I don't know if anybody in here was born a Jew. You may have been, but I'm pretty sure we're all Gentiles here. right? We ones who killed Jesus. And why? He's him once again. Excuse me. He takes all of our anger, takes all of our hatred, all of our sin, all of our darkness, and he lets us put them on the cross. And he says, I still not going to change my mind about you. How many of us are willing to go, like if I did all of that to Karen, would she change her mind about me? But she's like, I don't think I like Jimmy anymore. <laughs> she's hanging up on the cross, bleeding out. Yeah, I don't think I like that guy so much anymore. How many of us are willing to put up with the betrayal of a closest friend? Or one of our closest friends betrays us. How, what do we do? I'm not friends with that person anymore. Right? A, a, a spouse has an affair. How many times are we willing to let that slide? How many of us, if one of our children was murdered, are willing to stand before the person that murdered our child and say, I still love you? Right? Jesus allowed all of us to do all of that to him. And he still didn't change his mind about us. He was still hanging on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. I still love them. And all of their sinfulness, and all of their hatred and all of their anger, and all of their failure to understand who I am, I still love them. Why? Because before the foundation of the world, I predestined them to be adopted as my sons and as my daughters. And once again, I keep saying this, that sounds like good news. Like, I don't have to sell that. I should not have to spend so much time trying to convince people that that is good news. It should just sound like good news. Why is God beating the crap out of his own son? Why is God murdering his own son just so he could love you again? Better news than he just does already. Because before the foundation of the world, he chose you. God did not have to murder Jesus in order for us to do anything. We had to murder Jesus in order for him to show us, <laughs> I'm still here. You're still my children. Even after you murdered me, I still love you. But it's hard for us to see God that way if we don't see Jesus that way. And if we think that God and Jesus see us a certain way. If we think that they're looking at us, if we think that they can't even look upon us, you know I mean, they, I'm so terrible, God can't even look at me. But yet, what does is, what is the parable of the prodigal son say? That while you were still a long way off, 
The Father ran to you. You didn't have to go to the Father. All you had to do is do a little bit of repent. You know what? I don't need to live this life anymore. I've taken all my father's wealth. I've squandered it. I made a mockery of my father's name. Let me go back and just, Father, just allow me to be your servant. Treat me as one of your hired men. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The father didn't even acknowledge anything the son had to say. And while he was still a long way off, the father ran to him. The father embraced him. He put a ring on his hand. He put sandals on his feet. He threw a party for him. Because his son had come home, he was lost, but now he's found. He was blind, and now he sees. All the son had to do was turn around, and as soon as he turned around and started to go back home, the father ran to him. Because the father had never changed his mind about the son. The father had never said, you know what, that boy of mine, he's no longer my son Let's throw him into a lake of fire to burn forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. The father patiently waited and watched the son. He was looking, where is he at? And as soon as he saw him, he ran to him. And as the son began to send, I'm, I'm, can you imagine this? Rehearse the spiel. I mean, we've all had we all have had these had these tough conversations. You know, like when you're a teenager and you want something for your parents, and you try to rehearse it, and you, you know what I mean, or you, whatever it is you want, you want a promotion. You go talk to your boss. You rehearse your speech over and over and over again. And so the son is rehearsing his speech. He's like, okay, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just hire me as one of your servants. Therefore, I'll eat good, and and it's not a bad life being one of my father's servants. They got it pretty good, and and that's just what I'll do with the rest of my life. I'll just be one of my father. Okay, all right, all right, I'm, I got it. And as he's giving his spiel, the father's like, hey, shut up, boy. Get a ring. Put it on his hand. Put sandals on his feet. Stop talking. That's nonsense. I'm not listening to you. What kind of nonsense is it for you to say you don't deserve to be called my son? You always deserve to be my son. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've gone. That, the prodigal son, that is how God sees us. That's how he's always seen us. No matter where we were, no matter what we were doing. May not have made him happy, but he just sat there patiently waiting, knowing one day we we're going to say, you know what? I don't need to live like this anymore. And then he ran to us and embraced us and loved us. So if we can change the way we think God sees us, then we can begin to change the way we see God, we see Jesus. And then we can really begin to make some progress. Then we can really begin to live out the lives that we were called to live. Amen.